Hello, this is February 10th, 2009. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Joan Craig, and our cameraman today is Dan McDermott from Natick Pegasus. We are privileged to have with us today James Hastings, better known as Jim. Welcome, Jim. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Um, may I ask you when and where you were born? I was born in uh, Premier, Massachusetts in March of 1947. And you are currently living where? In Bellingham, Mass. And are you married? I am. Do you have children? I have four children, three girls and a son. And do they live in the area also? Uh, three of them fairly close, you know, Framingham, North Fork, and Bellingham. And <clears throat> one of them has been in the Marine Corps for 17 years, so he hasn't been around much. And judging by your shirt, you were also in the Marine Corps? I was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When and where did you enter the military? I enlisted in March of 1966 in Framingham. And why? Uh, well, I graduated from high school in 65, and I was going to college for a semester, and it didn't quite work out. And, uh, you know, I was, you know, working, and I just job going nowhere, so I figured, you know, I was probably going to get drafted sometime soon, and I just decided to enlist. And when you enlisted, you, did you immediately enlist with the Marines? Yes. And why did you choose the Marines? Uh, you know, being someone of small stature, I guess, I figured maybe there's some way I could, you know, prove myself, you know, because, you know, I always heard the Marines were the, you know, they had the toughest boot camp, and just want to try to prove you could do it, I guess. And you were willing to try to do that. Sure. Did any of your friends join with you or around the same time? Well, a lot of them. There was a lot of guys from Framingham, but no, I didn't. There was wasn't anyone I went in with. And and joining as an enlisted man, how much time did you have to give to the Marines? Well, at that time, you had an option of you know you could be a reservist, you could go in for two, three. For four years, and I enlisted for four years. How did your family feel about you going in? Well, it was pretty, pretty interesting. I, I, you know, <clears throat> went downtown to Framingham to enlist, and I came home that night. You know, we were going to have dinner and sitting down at the table, and my mother and father sitting one end of the table, and I sit next to my sister, and I mentioned how, you know, I said I got something to tell you today, and uh, I said I joined the Marine Corps today. And my father is sitting to my right, and he's, he got kind of upset. He said, well, I, you know, I waited. They came and got me, you know, when he was in World War II. My mother, <clears throat> sitting on the other end, she started crying. And my sister sitting next to me, she says, can I have his bedroom? <laughs> so it was kind of a mixed, sure. mixed reaction. So once you told them that you had enlisted, shortly thereafter, did you have to leave, or how long after? Uh, you know, I think it was, to be truthful, it was probably... In February or March, and I left on the 21st of March. And when you left, where did you go? Did Marines have a basic training? Yes, yeah, so, well, uh, we took a train uh, from South Station in Boston down to Paris Island. And had you ever been in that area before? No, I haven't. That's no, in the Carolinas? Right, South Carolina. And what was it like being, in, being outside of New England? Well, it was, uh, I remember after being there a few days, Patriot's Day was coming up, and I said, I kind of whispered this, you know, guy that was next to me, I said, gee, do you think they'll give us Patriot's Day off? And he said, what's Patriot's Day? <laughs> so I said, uh-oh. You know? Which is, is basically a Boston Right, so uh, um, it, it was different, you know. And tell us what, what basic training was like. We, we hear and we have a vision of it through movies and other such mm -hmm. areas of, um, of noticing. <clears throat> Tell us, from your point of view, what it was like. Well, it was just like a, after a couple of days there, like, the thought, first thought to go through your mind is, what the heck did I do? You know, it's just for the first few days, you're, you know, you're waiting for your drill instructors to come and pick you up, and it's just mass confusion. They, they're just, you know, messing with you to try to... Um, just keep you off guard and just constant movement and you know running everywhere to do anything everything you got to do and 
Uh, you know, and you finally get, <clears throat> after a couple of days, we got picked up by our drill instructors, and, you know, that's when it really started. The, you know, guys are just, you know, constantly screaming in your face. And, uh, and, and I assume not being used to that type of atmosphere, and you initially said, what am I doing here? Right. Did you learn that it, some of it might be a bit of a game, or did you, did you really... No, I think I was too scared to think of a game. I just mm -hmm. said, you know, this is, you know, they're going to, you know, make you a man. They're going to break you down. And, you know, a couple months after I got out of boot camp and I realized it finally hit me, I said, they did it. You know, they, they, they stripped you down and, you know, built you back up again to think like, a, like the Marine Corps wants you to. So they almost take you out of your core element of what you were like growing up. Sure. And as you said, strip that all away, right. and then, and then reshape you. Exactly. So, how long were you in boot camp? Um, I when I went, it was only twelve weeks. Oh, wait a minute, it was eight weeks. It was normally twelve weeks, but uh, we everyone called we were quantity Marines, not quality, because they needed you know so many more people with Vietnam starting up, and they wanted to try to get them in and out of Paris Island faster than what they were, what they normally did. Ha, were you hearing anything about what was going on overseas at no, all? No, no, no. Did you receive any advanced or specialized training beyond boot camp? Well, I was in, you know, the infantry. That's what my MOS was, and, you know, we, you'd go to Camp Lejeune afterwards for, to Camp Geiger. That was another month of infantry training. Um, and what was that like? That was a little less, you know, a little more relaxed, but it was still, you know, you had troop handlers, to, not with the intensity of the drill instructors, but, you, you know, out doing, you know, uh, field exercises to give you a little idea of what is expected, maybe when if you happen to go into combat and, you know, training, working with, you know, squad, and how a squad operates and fire teams which is built up around, you know, a Marine Corps rifle company and different elements of, you know, goes from a company to platoons and then squads and then fire teams and how what's expected of the Marines to operate in each, you know, one of those in a company and then, you know, what your jobs would be. And what was your job? I, my job, you know, was a, was a rifleman. That was everyone, you know, in the Marine Corps is a, basically a rifleman and then they have, you know, they're in West Lake in, a, in infantry, you have, you know, uh, mortars and machine gunners and rocket men and, you know, and then you have also radio operators and, you know, you learn a little bit about all that stuff and, you know, hopefully when you get, you know, to Vietnam you have, you know, a little bit of experience. So from the time you um, started with boot camp going to infantry training, et cetera, how long before you knew you were going to be shipped out? Well, I was one of the, I don't know if, I don't know, I'm still to this day trying to figure out how, uh, you know, how this happened. But, you know, there's probably, I, th I think we had about 85 Marines in my platoon and boot camp. And there was probably 65 to 70, 70 of them that went right to Vietnam. Somehow, you know, I got picked along with two other Marines. We went to a Marine barracks in New Jersey. You know, a few guys went to sea duty, and uh, but so for some reason, I didn't go right there. I went, you know, I was in New Jersey for nine and a half months. Um, and what did you do in New Jersey? Where, where were you stationed? At uh, Naval, Ammunition, Naval Ammunition Depot Earl in Colts Neck, New Jersey. And you were there for nine months? Not, right, nine and a half months. Every place I was was nine and a half months. Do you think it was because somebody liked you? I like to think I was just squared away. You know? Yeah. Yeah. But I still don't know why. So you were there, and what, what were your daily duties there? We, uh, we were a security uh, detachment for the Navy. They had a, a weapons facility there, and you know we provided security for them. We ran convoys down to the piers where they'd load ships um, with you know weapons. So while you were doing that over that nine and a half month period, were you able to come home at all to Framingham? Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. Yep. You know, usually had to work every other weekend and on that off weekend, either go to New York City, or, you know, come home to Framingham when mm -hmm. it was like, you know, flying into 
Logan was, I think, $11 a one way. Hasn't it changed? It, <laughs> now, doing that with these few men from your original platoon, did you establish some close relationships with these people? Oh, it's, you know, there was, when I was at, at Camp Lejeune going through infantry training, I ran in, I was standing at a chow line, and I heard this guy across the street singing with some guys under the boardwalk, and I'm thinking, I look, and I'm looking, I'm saying, geez, that looks like Fred. It was my buddy that I, you know, grew up with in Framingham. He had gone in a couple months before me, and I, you know, I snuck out a line, and I went over and asked him, I, you know, talking and stuff, and he goes, hey, you know, talk to where we're going to be stationed. He's, I said, where are you going to go? And he said, someplace in, New, I'm going to a place in New Jersey. Called, I says, Earl? And he goes, yeah. We both wound up at the same place. You know, we wound up in the same section across the aisle from each other, and we, you know, got liberty together, so. Are you at liberty to say his full name? Sure, uh, Fred Crowley. And he grew up with you in Framingham? Right. Did he go over with you? That's a long story. His connection with him and I, it's just it's hard to believe. It's like I told you how we met down there. We wound up in New Jersey together for the whole nine and a half months. He was there a couple weeks before me. You know, I had volunteered to go to Vietnam, you know, early in 1967. And, you know, I said, Fred, why don't you go? You know, he didn't want to go. And all of a sudden, you know, I was getting ready to get my orders. I got my orders on my birthday. And all of a sudden, he volunteered, too. So they got rid of us together. So we came home, went on leave. We were on liberty to get, you know, on leave together for, you know, I think we had 30 days and went out to California together. His older sister had just moved out there. And we stayed with her and her husband on weekends. And she got shipped out to Vietnam. <clears throat> Both went to the 1st Marine Division. He was with uh, 2nd Battalion, 5th Marines, and I was with 3rd Battalion, 7th Marines. And it wound up that we were right across the river from each other almost. And where in Vietnam were you? About 25 miles southwest of Da Nang. But after, you know, we've been there um, before the Tet Offensive started, his his group, uh, the 5th Marines, was sent up to Way City. And I stayed down where I was. And on February 13th, we both got shot the same day. He, he got home in about five, five or six days. He was back in Chelsea Naval Hospital. And I wound up, you know, in a hospital ship. And it took me almost a month and a half to get home. We wound up across the aisle from each other in the hospital. So it's almost like... In it another like, life, maybe you were twins. It was, it was just, you know, I tell people that story, and they look, and they go, you got to, you know. So tell us where you were stationed, um, not far from Da Nang. Right. And it was before the Tet Offensive, which was in 67? It was in 68. 68. I got, I, I got to Vietnam in June of 1967. June of 67. So tell us what it was like when, when you landed there, because it's such a different place. Right, it was, uh, you know, just the, the weather was the first thing to hit you getting off the plane. Um, and it's like a, you know, it was more like a staging area for Marines waiting orders. Guys were coming to go home, they had to go home, and guys were coming in country to go to their units, and, you know, they're deciding, you know, the higher ups where you're going to go, and so you're there for a couple of days, and, um, you know, then you get your riders to go to whatever company or regiment or battalion you're going to be in. And uh, so it's just, it's just, you know, waiting game there. You know, there's nothing to do, really. Just wait till they, some guys, you know, everyone is different. They probably could have got there and been gone an hour. I think I might have been there for a couple of days. And then before they sent me to my company, for some reason, they sent me to a demolition school for three days. So that delayed me a you a little bit getting out to my uh, company. Um, when you mentioned the weather, talk about that. It was just, you know, so humid. And, you know, the weather would change in a second. You know, like every day at 4 o'clock, it seemed, you know, the hill that I was on, you'd look out into the valley and right through, coming through the rice paddies in the mountains, you'd see that big stream. Of rain. Oh, it was just, you know, we'd had trenches going from bunker to bunker, and, you know, four feet deep, and they'd be half filled in a minute. 
it, it just came down so hard. Did they call them monsoons mm -hmm. at that time? Yes. So you went to demo school. It sounds to me like with all these little specialties that they saw there was some intelligence on your part that you could handle some of this. Do you think that's true? Uh, you know, not just like a knucklehead like the rest of them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it just, you know, everyone makes fun of us, you know, the grunts, so says, oh, here come the grunts, you know. Yeah. The knuckleheads, all the other guys, they get different MOSs, you know, and engineers and, you know, people in the air wing and say, but they always look at the grunts as the dummies. <laughs> but, you know, hey, you gotta get a love of grunt. So you, you, after demo school, where did they send you? Well, I just went out to um, regiment, the 7th Marine Regiment headquarters, and, you know, I was going down to collect some pay, and of course, right there, I went down to the bottom of the stairs to get my pay, and there's a guy from Framingham working in the paymaster. Really? <laughs> so, like, so I goes, oh, Charlie, what are you doing here? And, uh, you know, so I was there for probably not even a day, and they sent me out to battalion, to the hill that I was, my, you know, the rear area for my, for 3-7. What is 3-7? That's 3rd Battalion, 7th Marines. <clears throat> when they sent you out on this hill, were you with people you knew? No. Well, kind of, when I, you know, they sent me to battalion, you get, you get pick up gear that you need, you pick up your rifle, um, whatever else you're gonna need, and then they fly you up by helicopter to wherever your company's gonna be. And they were on, they had just come off this big operation and they were on this hill about 25, 30 miles southwest of Da Nang. Do you remember the name of the hill? Hill 52. Everything was a number. And I got there and uh, I'm getting off the chopper, I'm walking up the hill, and here's this Marine standing up there with his hips, hands on his hips, and, you know, ammo strung over his shoulders, and I look up and I goes, Mac. I goes, when did you get here? And he's, he goes, about two weeks ago. He was stationed with me in New Jersey. And he was in a different group, though. I never really saw him that much. And uh, I said, well, you know, we wound up in the same platoon. Uh, was he able to tell you what to expect, or were you kind of... Yeah, because Mac was, uh, you know, it was one of your questions, and your questionnaire was about this guy. He's, you know, it's... About a character that you remember? Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's just a, you know, a, a great friend. And you I know. gather from... Well, no, he wasn't killed in Vietnam. There's a, a story that connects us forever, and, you know, he died about seven years ago from cancer from Agent Orange. Uh, he did. But he, did you find a lot of people in your um, battalion had any kind of after effects from Agent Orange besides Mac? Oh, sure. Yeah, we, you know, I, I belong to an association that's, you know, that's, there's so, so much, you know, about what happened. Like it, when, you know, when, when I left Vietnam, I never got to say goodbye to anyone. <clears throat> and 23 years later, I got a phone call one night on my daughter's 16th birthday, and my son answered, and he said, Dad, it's some guy named Mac. And I'm going, oh, I just, my body just went numb. Because you, know, you hadn't talked to I him? I hadn't talked to anyone, you know. And backing up a little bit, you never got to say goodbye to anyone because um, why? Because I, I was wounded. So and he was standing right in front of me. There's little piece of shrapnel I had in my face that came out of his back when he got shot, he got shot through the neck. And I got shot in my leg and we both went flying. And <clears throat> you know, I, I was wondering what the heck, and it was when he got shot, that piece came out of his back into my face. And, uh, you know, that was the last time I saw him. We were laying next to each. We finally got out of there. They got us to a battalion aid station. And I was laying next to him on a, on a gurney, you know, and I said, Mac, hang in there, you know. And that was the last time I saw him. And 23 years later, he, you know, he called me. He found me. But you knew, did you know after a bit of time that he did make it? No. So you, even after you were injured, you didn't know if he made it or not? No. So let's, let's 
go back a little bit. You you arrived in June of sixty seven. Right. Um, and were you in combat right away or? Well, we you know it was just our mission was just to run patrols and ambushes and to try to engage the enemy. And did you? At uh, times, sure. And for, I'm say, thinking, what were you, about 17 or 18, 18, No, 19? I was, I was uh, 20. 20 at the time, yep. for a 20-year-old, and never having been faced with this type of situation, but being trained for it. What was it like for you the first time that you realized that this really is war? Well, it was something you, you know, they train you for, but it's nothing that they could ever train you for what happens, you know, in real life. To, you know, when you see people, you know, being killed or, or blown up, uh, you know, they can tell you about it, but when you see it, it just it overwhelms you, you know. And, and the first time you saw it versus the second time, <clears throat> was there a difference? I mean... There's something then you just kind of kind of have to put it in the back of your mind and keep on going. You know, if to survive. You right. You stop and think about it. You know, you got to, you know, of course you do, but, uh, you know, you say, you know, I hate to see it, but uh, you can't keep dwelling on it or you'll be, you know, a basket case. So tell us about some of the <coughs> combat that you, you did. Were you always on this hill? Yeah, you know, for some reason, you know, a lot of guys in the Marine Corps and or the Army even, you know, they were moved from place to place while they were there. For some reason, my company stayed on this hill. Uh, I was there, for, I was on that hill for nine months, and uh, we ran patrols and ambushes and operations off that. Uh, the, on the eve of the Tet Offensive, we were evacuated from the hill because they knew that, you know, the NVA were coming to doing something was going to go on, and we were right in their path, and they... And NVA, uh, I know North what Vietnamese they Army. Right. You know, and they were, on, obviously, what happened, they were on their way to Da Nang, and they wanted to get us off of there because they knew we'd probably be annihilated if we stayed there. So for the last 13 days before I was wounded, we were just kind of roaming the countryside, but for the whole time I was there, I was on that hill, basically, except for two weeks. So... When you talk about your company being on the hill, approximately how many of you were there? there? You know, 150. You know, we had two platoons on one hill, and then we had a second platoon was on a hill about two miles away. At the end, though, we were all on the same hill because they were overrun. And, um, they, you know, after about three weeks, we went out there, my platoon, to take over for them. They had so many guys who were killed at... They came and we went there and about, we were there for about three weeks and they finally, you know, gave up the hill and we went back to the other hill. Now when you left Hill 52 to go to this other hill, did you know what you were getting into? That there was so much going on that so many of the other soldiers had died? Well, we didn't, well, we, you know, radio reports, I can't remember exactly if we knew the night before, but. You know, it was probably, the, uh, there wasn't another day there where I felt so helpless. You know, they get hit about two in the morning and, I mean, just all hell broke loose. That place was, every fireworks combined I ever saw in my life. They had 28 Marines on the hill and I think there was about 200 NVA who attacked them. And 10 of them were killed. I think eight were wounded and the rest came you know, to our hill, and we had to go over there in the morning and relieve them. And I mean, just, you know, there were bodies everywhere from the NVA that were killed, and we, you know, they were medevac and our Marines, and, you know, along the dead with the dead and the wounded. Uh, How far away was that other hill? It was about two miles from us. So you saw everything? Oh, well, we could see it. We. You know, right away when you see that happening, you know, everyone had their gear on, they were ready to go, and the battalion <clears throat> sent the word down that you're not going. We, we're not going to let you go because they figured that they knew we'd go out and 
they would have us waiting for us on an ambush if we came as soon as we came off a uh, hill, and they, you know, so they wouldn't let us do anything. We just had to sit there for an hour and watch it. So during that hour, was there conversation, or were you all pretty stunned and quiet? Oh, we were, everyone was, you know, everyone was mad as hell. That you couldn't we, go. That we couldn't go. You know, just, whoa, you know, because my buddy Mac, he was, you know, he was gone. I had just come back from Okinawa. I sent, went to NCO school, and then when I came back, he went. So, you know. While you were in Vietnam, you went to NCO school? Right. How long were you there for? Three weeks. And then he went after me. We were, you know, when I came back, they made me a squad leader, and then, you know, Mac, he was already one, and, he, you know, and then uh, rather another guy, he went to language school, the three of us, you know, were squad leaders in our platoon. But he, you know, not that he would have made any change anyone's mind, but, you know, Mac was a real leader, you know, everyone, because he was, he was probably the, he was a, so when I came back from that school, we had a new guy. He was Chinese, American-born Chinese. And I get out to the hill, and they said, he said, oh, you got Jim Hastings? And I goes, yeah. And he says, well, I heard about you. And he said, oh, what about, what's with this guy, Mac? He goes, he, he keeps watching me. You know, I, I started laughing. I said, you know, I said, yeah, you just got to learn how to read him. He said he's a great guy, but he, you know, oh, he was as mean as they come. But, you know, the last, from that day I got in touch with him, you know, we were just the best of friends, you know. Now, when, when this new officer, was he, the Chinese American? No, no, he was just, a, you know, a squad an enlisted leader, Marine. An enlisted, he was a, when he said he heard about you, what did oh, he... I'd been in a, I'd been in a, I was walking point one day, and, you know, there was a couple NVA, I mean, Viet Cong down in this area, and... You know, I came upon them and, you know. Walking point meaning you were first. Right. H how far away were your um, other, were the other Marines from you? Well, the next guy behind me was probably, you know, eight, ten feet. And were you walking through trees, jungle? No, this was an area called Charlie's Ridge. You know, we had one area. On one side of the hill was called Charlie's Ridge, and on the other side of a river was called the Arizona Territory. And we patrolled, you know, both areas. And one side was just sheer mountains. And, and explain, I want to hear the rest of the story, but explain, explain for those who, are list, who will hear this video and see it, Viet, Viet, Viet Cong versus NVA. Right. The, the NVA difference. were North Vietnamese soldiers from North Vietnam. Who came down into South Vietnam. came down Vietnam. to South Vietnam to, mm -hmm. you know, to reclaim that part of the country, Vietnam. Right. And the Viet Cong were local South Vietnamese guerrillas who fought for the North Vietnamese. So and at the same time, the U.S. also had Vietnamese fighting for them, right? Correct. They had, you know, they had Vietnamese Marines. They had popular forces. Uh, there was two or three different, you know, groups we worked with. You know, the popular forces, PFs, they called them. Okay. Uh, so your work walking point on Charlie's Ridge yeah. was it an actual ridge? Oh, it was a ridge. There was, you know, valleys, and then there was just a sheer mountain. And, you know, the, v the NVA, when they'd come over this ridge to go at nighttime across, you know, the valley to over to the Arizona Territory. And uh, the 7th Marines, when I was there, we were a blocking force for Da Nang. And that there was, a, you know, an area of an arc that we covered to try to keep, you know, them out of Da Nang area. You were trying to keep them right. back. Right, right. But, you know, of course, not always successful. So your walking point, though, and... Yeah, it was nothing big. It was just a couple, you know, Viet Cong were down there, and I came upon them, and, you know, you know, after I left and Jerry came on, you know, into the company, they were saying how, you know, you know, this whatever, you know, what happened, and 
So we just, it was nothing really big. But what was it? Well, I just opened up on them because they were, you know, there was two enemy there and it, was, it wasn't a big deal. Well, you, you had to also save your own life, correct? Right, well, you know, uh, yeah, you know, you do what you're supposed to do, I guess. So, was this other Chinese American gentleman a leader to both you and Mac, or was he sort of? He was equal. Okay. He was an enlisted. He was a. We were all corporals at the time. <clears throat> uh, corporals and squad leaders. Right. And how how large was your squad? Yeah, it depends. You know, it usually twelve to fourteen Marines, but you know we were lucky if we had seven or eight, nine Marines. You know. But, people coming and going and guys getting injured. Uh, was that difficult for all of you that day by day you saw injury and death and, and still had to continue on or, or was there a sense that this is what I was broken down and built up for? Yeah, you had to develop a, a, a sense to just keep it in, your, in, in the back of your head, you know, that, uh, just put it out of your mind completely. Because if you, like I said before, if you keep dwelling on it, saying, well, you know, this guy happened, this happened to him, or this happened to so-and-so, you just, you couldn't do it. You know, and I guess that's why, you know, a lot of problems people have years later with PTSD, you know, that stuff. Post-traumatic stress surfaces disorder. Surfaces again, you know, mm -hmm. and dealing with that. Um, you and Mac then were um, on a patrol? Were you on Hill 52 or were you on no, the other No, we've been evacuated already. Already from evacuated. From my hill, 41 and years ago, Friday. Same date, Friday the 13th. So you remember that so vividly? Oh. Tell us what happened. Every day. Uh, <clears throat> well, we were, like I said, we were kind of roaming the countryside when I didn't even know we, you know, I found out years later we were on an operation and we had, you know, our platoon was at this area and we had a, you know, Max squad was out the day before and they had killed an NVA nurse. So that patrol was over the next day. Another squad went out for some reason to the same area and what it turned out was it was a staging area for the NVA and there was, you know, in that immediate era, area there was, you know, hundreds if not, I'm not sure, thousands of, you know, in a general vicinity within a couple, you know, few square miles, but that's a lot for that one area. So we had a squad went out and they got pinned down. <clears throat> and then they sent out another squad as a reactionary to and help them. Meaning back up? Back up to help them get out of, you know, to, for support. And then they were pinned down. And at the same time, they called for my squad to go out. Now, we were still back in the C command post area for our platoon. My lieutenant was there and Mac, because Mac didn't go out because he was supposed to go that day on R&R. &R. Which is a vacation. Vacation. Mm -hmm. The chopper comes in and it lands in our area. Lieutenant says, Mac, get on the chopper. And he says, Lieutenant, I'm not going. Those are my... He sounds like a very unique individual. He said. Very pro-Marine. Those are my Marines. He mm -hmm. said, I'm going. I know where they are. I'm, gonna, I'm taking them. I'm going out. Because he had already heard that Right. They... He knew. And he knew that, you know, where they were, how to get there. <clears throat> so he had a chance to go this way or that way. The chopper flew off. You know, he could have been safe as, you know, you and I are sitting right here. but. So we went out, we got to the first squad. They had a couple of KIAs. We had called them medevac. Mm -hmm. We got them on the chopper and it was an open field and we could see off in the distance where you know the firefight was going on. <clears throat> and it turned out there were two Marines in Max squad who were in this thicket that were pinned down. And it turned out that the NVA were in fighting holes. They'd pop up, they'd shoot these two guys, 
they scream. They so a fighting hole is literally a hole. Hole in the ground with connected to tunnels. Yeah. What they had, <clears throat> you know, uh, and they had this probably who knows how for years in this area, you know, but they every once in a while, you know, they pop up and shoot these two Marines, knowing that we'd come to get them. So you were with Mac at that time. Well, it was I went Mac, and then myself. And then Tony Camacho, he was the machine gun squad leader on a platoon. We probably shouldn't have done this, all three squad leaders, you know, going out there. But, you know, and then there was another Marine behind Tony. So we got, you know, we kneeled down in this narrow trail and got down. We looked off into the distance, you know, not distance, it was like 10 feet. We could see them there. And Max stopped, turned around and said, well, you know, we're going to try to do this and drag them out. We got up and took about two steps and I go flying through the air. Mac, I think he got spun around and his face was green. I'll never forget as long as I live. He, he fell back, my rifle went flying, I got shot in my leg and we wound up for somehow God was there. We were in this trench and he was in front of me, I was behind him and then the other two guys behind me, I don't know what, what they were doing but I'm laying in a trench and I can't find my rifle and I'm, I'm trying to look up and all of a sudden, you know, like the grass is being cut down over my head. They're popping out of the fighting holes again and trying to, you know, hit us. With? With their rifles, with their, you know. Guns. With their guns. Right. So, you know, I don't know how long this happened. I kept trying to get up and finally Tony Camacho was able to get to me and he put a battle dressing on my leg and then all of a sudden I started bleeding out of the side of my face and he goes, oh, what the hell do you do, you know? And so all of a sudden, you know, how this guy never was shot, I just can't imagine. But they started to open up again and everyone dove again and we're still laying there. And then, you know, it just keeps going. I, I don't even know how long I was there, but all of a sudden second platoon came, second platoon came up as a reactionary. Now, prior to them coming, was there any radio man that could, or did well, they, was all, they all knew? They all knew, yeah, because it's been going it. on. The whole company knew what was going on, but they were, other platoons were in it, different areas. But eventually, at the end of the day, the other two platoons were there, too, because one of the squad leaders from 2nd Platoon, all of a sudden, I see him near me. He's leaning over me, and I said, Wayne, go get Mac. He's worse than me. So he came and picked up Mac, ran out, got him, threw him over his shoulder, ran out, got him into a, a little more secured area, came back and got me, got probably five steps and I'm flying through the air again. He, uh, I got shot two more times in my leg and I got shot through my arm. I was over his Wayne's back and I took a round in through my arm <clears throat> and it went into his back. And, you know, we're both laying there again. So he got hit also. He got hit. And then all of a sudden, this guy from 1st Platoon came. And I remember some guy carrying me out, this guy, uh, his nickname was Horse, big, huge guy. He carried me out to another area. <clears throat> and then <clears throat> I remember looking up, they had me covered with a poncho. And I could look up and I could see over in the distance, I could see they had Wayne propped up against a tree. It was a round that went into my arm went into his back and we we're waiting for choppers to come in to get us out of there and I never said so many Hail Marys in my life and they finally brought in a chopper. And how, how long a period of time do you think I don't was? remember. Yeah. Could have been a couple hours. Uh, that long? I don't, even, I don't know. I can't, I can't remember. Did you stay conscious? Yeah, I could feel, I could feel myself starting to go into shock. And I asked for someone to give me, I remember asking for someone to give me a stick to bite on. Because I felt like I was swallowing my tongue. Because my arm, when I, after I was laying on the ground, I looked down and my arm from my elbow down was going straight back that way. And I said, oh geez, and I picked it up and it was like grabbing a chair that was like, wasn't even, couldn't even feel anything. Couldn't feel it. And I laid it across my chest and then you know, the other guys started coming and they finally brought in the chopper and they got us 
I think there was about seven or eight of us they threw on there, which was way overweight. And they put me on and they put Wayne on and taught me last. And he's laying this far from me. His face is like right on top of me. And he's, you know, am I going to live? Am I going to live? And I said, Wayne, hang in there. You're going to make it. You'll make it. And he died right in my face. Oh, my. That had to be so difficult for you. And was Mac with you then, too? He was in the chopper, the same chopper. Wayne had 11 days before he went home. Oh. Was he also around 20 years old, too? He was, you know, years later, Mac and Jerry Chong and myself were out in California at a reunion, <clears throat> walking through Chinatown, and, you know, we started talking about birthdays. And it turned out that Mac was born March 21st, 1947. Wayne Spear, who carried him and I out, was born. March 25th, 1947. I was born March 31st, 1947. So you were all one in spirit, weren't you? All 10 days apart, you know, in our birth, you know. Wayne was awarded the Silver Star for what he did. Did he have family that? He had another story <laughs> that's just, you know, we were down in Washington, I think, the first year Mac got in touch with me in 1989. In that following April, he said, any time you want to go to the wall, I'd never been there. And he, you know, talking to, I talked to Jerry was down in D.C. They got in touch with me on Veterans Day in 1989. And <clears throat> I talked to Mac, you know, for a couple hours, and he said, well, Jerry's still down in D.C. So I talked to him, called him, and I was talking about stuff, you know, you know that happened on the 13th. And, you know, I always thought Wayne Spear was from Alabama. And he goes, no, he was from Baltimore. And it was a guy, another guy that we were trying to get to that was killed. He was from Alabama. So I got confused there. But as soon as I got off the phone with him, I got on information down in Baltimore trying to find a spear. You know, the second call I made, it was this lady. She goes, I'm, I know who you, I know I'm, I was his aunt. And I can give you, putting you in touch with his brother. And I called. You spoke to his brother. Was he younger or older? He was younger. He went in the Marine Corps. He, he wanted did. to go in there to avenge his brother's death. You know, and it was just a long story. They lived in a, a tenement block in Baltimore, and I said, I, you know, I said, I'd love to meet your mother. You know, and she didn't want to do it. She couldn't open up the wounds. Mm. But, uh, you know, I said, you know, Ken, we'd like to meet you. And he says, no, I can't do it. I can't do it. And, by the time we walked down from our hotel room down to the lobby to check out, the clerk says, is Jim Hastings here? And I goes, yeah, that's me. He says, there's a phone call here from you, for you. And it was Ken. And he said, I'll meet you. This was in 89? 1990. 1990. That's when you went to D.C.? Right. And we, he told us where to go. We're going down the street. And I see this guy leaning against a telephone pole. I saw the saw reincarnation. I go, you got to be kidding me. Look just I like goes, him. He goes, there he is. So I think there were five of us. We pulled in, and there was a restaurant bar getting ready, you know, hadn't opened. And we walked in, and the guy goes, I'm not open. And he said, we told him, you know, we probably said, oh, you can, you know, you're more than welcome. So, you know, we sat there for a couple hours talking and just telling him what happened. Mm -hmm. It was important for him to know, don't you think? Yep. Brought a little closure to him. Had to be tough for all of you. Oh. Now, when you were injured and they took you out by helicopter, where did they take you? They took me to a battalion aid station in Da Nang. And I was the only one that was really <clears throat> ambulatory. Most of the, everyone else had stomach wounds, and they kept them in a the hospital in Da Nang. And they sent me out to the USS Sanctuary. And I was, you know, they, I was in traction for about three weeks. And in traction, both legs and your arm? No, just, I just, you know, battle dressings on my legs. And then I was in traction for my for arm. For your arm. And then we eventually sailed to the Philippines and got there sometime in uh, March, I think. March of? 68. 68. And, uh, you know, from there I went to Guam. I had an operation there, and then from Guam I went to Hawaii, and I was in California, Texas, Illinois. 
And was this all, you were in all of those places because of treatment? Well, a couple of them. Mm -hmm. You know, some of them we were just, you know, we were dropping off other patients and some places we had to stay overnight. Uh, my, had, my final orders were for Portsmouth Naval Hospital and I was ticked off. I said, you know, all, along, all the way home, and when I found out I was going there, I said, I, gee, I live in Framingham right outside of Chelsea. You know, so I finally got to Andrews and I was in the hospital down there, and you know, it's usually a 24 hour turnaround. I was there for five days. When I turned 21, Martin Luther King was assassinated. President Johnson announced he wasn't going to run for president again. And the guys, the people, you know, doctors, nurses are coming in and say, geez, no one's ever been here as long as you have. And finally, the sailor came in from Gitmo, Guantanamo Bay. Okay, and he was going up to New Hampshire. And they, said, you get, you, here's your ride out of here, because there's two of you now. They just didn't want to fly one person. So I got up there, and I, first thing I said, the doctor, I said, I live in here and here, you know. And he says, yeah, it doesn't make any sense. So I got my orders, put down Chelsea Naval Hospital, and there was a corpsman, corpsman over there. He lived in Lynn. And he says, hey, doc, don't you live near Boston? And he goes, yeah. He says, hey, take this guy down to Chelsea Naval Hospital. So they got me down there that night. I didn't even have to stay there. So when, with all of these orders, you were still in the hospital. Oh, yeah. yeah. So yeah. what was it like? Now, back up a little bit. Um, what was it like for your family to get word about your being injured? You know, they, I don't think they even knew until I called. They gave me a phone when I was in a hospital ship. And I, I don't think they even, at that point, had contacted my family. I can't remember, you know, they, you know, but I still have the telegrams that they sent my mother, but they, you know, eventually sent, you know, telegrams that I was wounded and, you know, and then the next one, you know, prognosis is good and so on. So between the telegrams and your phone call, do you know how much time elapsed? No, I don't. And you were on a hospital ship? Yes. Was that from the Philippines? Oh, no. It was a... Navy, naval ship, naval hospital ship. And that's and, and <clears throat> where did that take you? It took me. What it did was it it would go in Vietnam and it sail up and down the coast, and they'd pick up casualties, you know, injured Marines, or sailors, you know, and of course I met sure the guys, you know, soldiers too, and they'd get the ship full or whatever, and they'd sail to either the Philippines or to Japan. And I happened to go that time. We were going to the Philippines, Philippines, to Subic Bay. And uh, we were there for a couple of days. And then they got me a flight to, uh, to Guam. Did you know anyone else? No. Um, on the ship? On the ship or no. So what was, you hear stories even now about the care that you do or don't receive. What was your medical care like, both over there and at Chelsea Naval? You know, I, I swear that I'm just amazed that I have an arm. When I saw that, I said, you know, there's no way. You know, I ran into a guy at a reunion one year, and he said, I, I remember them carrying you out, and your arm was just hanging like a piece of meat. And how the Navy, how they you know, you hear a lot of people, you know, bad mouth, you know, Navy doctors and stuff, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't have an arm if it wasn't for them. Are you at liberty to show us the scar, or would you prefer not to? That's, I don't know, it's nothing big, it's just... And you have motion? You have... Good I've got, you know, I get limited motion in my wrist, my fingers. Uh, you know, it's come a long way in 41 years. What was it like once you reached Chelsea to reunite with your family? Oh, uh, just, you know, did you, not that it was that long I was gone, not even a year, but it just feels like you, know, you just had the weight taken off your shoulders, you know, that you're safe, you know. What was it also like for you knowing that it wasn't a popular war or was becoming a less popular war? Well, I, I remember, you know, we used to get uh, 
Sea Tiger and there was a newspaper by the military and Stars and Stripes and there'd be, you know, stories in there like in the late 67 about people starting to protest against the war and, you know, guys were just bull, you know, we were over here and these guys would get, you know, back there doing this and that and burning flags and draft cards and weren't a bunch of happy people. You weren't? No. So how long were you in Chelsea? Altogether from April till uh, November. Of 60, 68. 68. And how much time then did you have left in the Marine Corps after that? I would have had, oh, maybe a little over a year. And did you? Did you finish off? No, I was medically retired out of the Navy Yard in Charlestown. So then what was it like coming home to, was it still Framingham that you were coming home to? Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and now you're 21 years old and you've been through hell. What was it like for you to come home to Framingham and start over? Well, it was tough at first, you know. Uh, you know, I mean, at first it was great, you know, you see all your friends and, um, you know, a lot of drinking was involved. You know, you know, it was the last couple of months in the hospital was, you know, it was crazy. Some of the stuff we used to do, you know, getting, in, you know, getting in trouble and stuff. And can you tell us about any of that? Uh, I don't know. Sure, go ahead. No, it was, it's, you know, like we. You know, a lot of times we'd sneak out in our bathroom pajamas and go over to, you know, go over to Fenway Park. <laughs> used to play 50 cents to sit out in right field. And we met Eddie Popowski one day. He used to be the third base coach, and I think he thought we fell off, you know, some planet. <laughs> you know, we'd sit out there in right field yelling and screaming at, uh, I think, was it Lou Clinton? And uh, probably we'd just have a great time. You know, they used to take us to different parties and all that stuff, and, you know, one night, unfortunately, we got in this huge altercation with a bunch of hippies in Boston Common and Arlington Street Church, and had a couple of guys, and you know, the guy that I was in New Jersey with, Fred, he, him, and another guy was stabbed. Ooh. You know, we, so there was a lot of crazy stuff that happened. They know. were okay, though. Were they super? Fun? Well, yeah, they were okay. Well, one guy, actually, the guy from Long Island, he was given last rites. He had a five-inch wound in his back. Did they catch the kid guys who did Yeah, they got him, and he eventually got off. Geronimo, that was his name. Unbelievable. But that was... So when you came home then, what happened? What did you do? Well, did you continue on an outpatient basis at Chelsea? Oh, well, the VA. After I was discharged, it was on November 30th, 1968, and... Uh, and what was your rank? I was a sergeant. Um, you came home. You're you're on a medical disability. Yes. yes? Mm -hmm. um, trying to catch up with friends. Did you relax for a while? Did you decide to? Well, I I was you know I. It was hard for me to do anything, I, you know, with my hand. Back then, it took, you know, a couple, two or three years before I was able to really even start to write with it again. You're right-handed. Yes. You know, and I went to a couple of schools that didn't work out, and I was just, you know, drinking too much and doing too much crazy stuff, you know, having a good time. Uh, you know, and I finally, you know, smartened up a bit, and I... I went up to UMass, you know. Amherst? Right. And, and did you finish school I just, there? you know, just an associate's degree. I went to Stockbridge School of Agriculture. And, uh, and how old were you at that point? I was 24. What made you turn around your life at that point? What made you realize that partying and drinking? So that I'd probably be dead. Mm-hmm. So you did an associate's degree. Was that a two-year program? Yes. And then what did you do? I uh, 
I went to work for a, for a landscaper. Um, had issues, you know, with someone telling me what to do. You know, it didn't really work out. Um, I started my own business for about three or four years, you know, and still having problems with probably, you know, I was married then. I got married, and but I was still having, you know, problems with, you know, drinking and, uh, you know, maybe in the back of my head, you know, trying to get it together. Uh, Did you have flashbacks at that point? Oh, I, yeah. I used to dream that they were chasing me through my group in the in the mustard field in Framingham. Uh, it was a great place back in the 50s and 60s, but I used to have dreams that the, the, they were chasing me through my neighborhood. You know. Were you getting help back then? No. Uh, you mentioned earlier in this conversation about post-traumatic stress. Do you have you ever experienced or yep. have um, you been treated for it? Yes. Yep. Are you still treated for it? Uh, you know, I do. I get together with about four or five guys I used to go to this group with for years, and the lady who ran it retired. Unfortunately, she's a great lady, and you know we still to get together. So that helps for lunch all the time. We, you know, five of us talk. We're all, all of us were wounded, you know, and three of them are in, actually in Chelsea Naval Hospital. They are now. No, no, or they, they were, were yeah. with you. I never knew them then. Oh, okay. Uh, two of the guys were in my platoon in Vietnam. One guy's from Braintree, another guy from Arlington. Uh, we were there, this other guy, that guy from Arlington, I didn't even know him when I was there. The first time I ever saw someone who was killed, he was with me. But he was from Arlington, I was from Framium. I never even. You never connected I that. I was out in California, the second reunion I went to, and two guys came up to me and said, You know a guy named Bob Collins from Arlington? I goes, No. I said, Geez, I lived in Framingham too. And he said, Well, he was in 3rd Platoon. I goes, And they I said, Why? I said, That's, I was there at the same time. And they said, Well, we just had the cops go out to his house. We tracked him down. And I said, Well, I'll trap the call him when I get home. You know, so I, you know, this was in July. And I called him and you know, talk to him and I was telling him about this guy and that. He says, I know them guys. He says, I don't remember you though. And it was like, every time I called, he used to tell me afterwards, you know, he said, he'd tell his wife, he says, is that that guy Hastings? He said, tell him I'm not here. <laughs> he was just creeping him out because I oh, knew so many gosh. people that he knew. He knew, but you didn't connect. It was finally from July, it was finally December before he agreed to meet me. And what year is that? Around? 1991. And we've been the best friends very helpful too, I'm sure. Yep. What you've all great been guy, you know. Uh, he's just giving the shirt off my back. He's just. Well, it sounds to me like, in in spite of the horror, or because of the horror, that you've all witnessed, that you have maintained relationships that are as close as a brotherhood. Oh, the more. Mm -hmm. It feels. Don't want to really say it, but sometimes you feel closer to those guys than you do your own family. Because they've been through something that you can all identify with, don't you? Don't you think that could be the reason also? Oh, no, definitely. Yeah, all those guys were with me the day that I was wounded. The guys who came home. The th thing is, though, they were all dead. Everyone that was there with me, Wayne Spear, who got killed that day, Mac, who was in front of me, he he died, like I said, of cancer. Tony Camacho, the guy who came up and bandaged my leg in 1996, he got killed in a boating accident. Mm. The guy behind him who told me he had wrapped up my arm, Jim Elliott, he dropped out of a heart attack in 1998. Still my, young. My platoon commander who told Mac to get on the chopper and go on R&R, &R, he was standing next to me in 1993 at the Women's Memorial the, the, the day after they dedicated it, closer than you and I right now. Standing right next to me, I'm taking a picture. He dropped dead. You know, Heart attack. I used to talk to these guys every week. You know. When you went to the memorial in D.C., what was that like? You were with Mac and mm -hmm. a few others there. What was that like for you? 
And did you also visit any of the other memorials that were there? No, I mean, we didn't visit Vietnam Memorial was the only one there at the time. The Korean Memorial wasn't there, or the World War II, uh, the women's. Um, you know, it was just overwhelming to see Wayne Spears' name there. Knowing how close you were. You know, and the guy standing next to me was, you know, so much of a part of what he did, you know, given his life to carry us out mm -hmm. after we were wounded. When you came home, I know you mentioned partying and drinking. You were still young. Did you discuss with your family, or was there ever an interest in discussing what you had been through? No. Uh, they never really said much. I think one night I told my mother and father something. I came home and I was drunk. I told them about something that happened. Did you no. Know, Did they wasn't. ever talk to you about the drinking? Yeah, they, they, you know, they're concerned. But, so. but having told them this story, did they see realistically what you had been through? They didn't say, but I'm sure my father understood. Having been he in, was the, in you know, World War II. World War II. Did you join any unit of the reserves at no, no, all? I was, no, you couldn't. No. And did you join any veterans organizations? You know, the only thing I joined in 1968 was the Disabled American Veterans. Are you still a part of that? Yes, I became a life member, uh, but I wasn't an active or any active in it. They just helped me out once. Are you active at all in it now, or? No other organizations. I'm, in, I am. Such as. Everything. You're in all of those. Well, I belong, you know, to here in Framium Natick to the Marine Corps League, you know, to the Mike Three Seven Vietnam Association. You know, there's other organizations where you don't really, you know, the military order, the Purple Heart, and things like that. But, you know, I'm involved in, in Bellingham, chairman of the Memorial and Veterans Day Committee. So you're very busy with yeah. veteran-oriented programs. Mm -hmm. Where were you when you got the Purple Heart? Right that last day I was in Vietnam. They gave it to you then? Do you no, no, I was in the hospital ship when they gave it to me. Okay. Oh, when I got it, I mean, well, I thought you meant when I got you. No, I was on the hospital ship. And do you remember what it was like, or did you just feel... I got a picture of it. It's a little black and white with this, looking up like this, you know, and some general. I found out his name years later. I can't think of it now, but he was, you know, pinning, put it on my, on my uh, sheet or whatever it was Hospital Johnny or whatever right, it was. Right, whatever it was. And, um, you know, I left that. I left that at the, at the Vietnam Memorial for... Wayne's beer. You did. That's so touching. Um, I don't want to assume anything, so I'm going to ask anyway. Um, you do receive veterans benefits and hospitalization benefits, and mm -hmm. did you use the GI Bill for your? For UMass. You yep. did. Yeah. Um, do you have family members or children who have gone into the service? You, mm -hmm. you mentioned that earlier. Your son? My son's been in the Marine Corps for 17 years. How did you feel about him going in? You know, a lot of guys, they say they don't want their kids to be any part of it, you know, it's a military, but, you know, I was proud of him. Uh, Has he gone overseas at all? He's been to Iraq three times. And what is it like for a father who had serious injuries in Vietnam, knowing that his son is going over to an area that is also has the possibility of injury? Well, very, very apprehensive, mm -hmm. you know. But uh, just a different feeling from my wife, you know. It's, I don't know, it's hard to explain. No one, that's what it is, that's what he does. and. And unfortunately, if something happens, I mean, you pray to God it doesn't, but you know, there's always that possibility. But That's the Marine talking, isn't it? 
whereas the mother is the mother. Mm -hmm. Do you, you mentioned attending reunions. Do you continue to attend your reunions? Yep. And is it difficult for you now to see so many of your good, good friends passing away? Mm -hmm. We have a memorial service and we read the names of all our casualties from each year. You know, one, one Marine does it for each year. And, and now we have a list of guys who have died since we come home and that's almost as big a, as the ones that we lost in Vietnam, you know. Guys, you know, average age is probably 61 or so now. And there's so many guys that died, it's just amazing. How important to you was serving in the military? You know, back then it was, you know, I don't think it meant as much to me as it does now. I, you know, especially since things started in Iraq and Afghanistan, you know, not wanting things to happen to Marines or anyone, anyone, soldiers or anyone like the way that happened to Vietnam veterans. And, you know, I, I just, you know, more proud of what I did now than I think I was back then because I was too crazy then, I guess, you know. Do you also feel that there is a, um, a sense of, um, apology from people in the nation towards the Vietnam veterans because they, they, they were doing a duty, they were doing a job, you were doing a job, and yet when you came home there was such negativity. Do you get a sense that opinions have changed? I, I think a lot have. I think there's still some hardcore people that think, you know, still think less of the Vietnam veterans. I mean, just the other day there was a quote about Val Kilmer, you know, that thought that Vietnam veterans were a bunch of losers and goons and jerks and he could better represent a Vietnam veteran in a movie to tell what their story is. So, I mean, you got to be kidding me. You know, so this, I think there's a lot of people that still look down on him. Do yeah. you agree with the effort that's being made to say currently with Iraq, Iran, and Afghanistan. Um, you may hate the war, but you don't hate the individuals that are over there helping, doing their job. Do you feel that that is an occurrence and also that... Um, Excuse me. I meant to turn it off. Sorry. Uh, and also that um, they want to make sure that there is this difference of opinion with those individuals, men and women, who are over uh, fighting for a cause. You know, I'm sorry, I apologize for that. That's I missed okay. The beginning of your uh, I just the qu the question being, because of what has transpired with veterans who served in Nam versus current day. I see, at least in writing, and I'm wondering if you see it personally, that individuals may dislike what's going on there as far as being over there, mm -hmm. but are making every effort to say, yet we're proud of our soldiers. Do you see that? Yes. And do you think it's happening because of the situation with your generation in Vietnam? I think 100% that Vietnam veterans you know, not sacrifice, but we, what happened to, what happened to us when we returned, not necessarily me because of the way I came home, but the way a lot of guys came home who, you know, guys who really, you know, you'd say it, they were spit on and called, you know, baby killers and everything else. And, and you know, it, it did happen, but I think that we sacrificed that. So now these younger veterans who are coming home won't be subjected to that. That's true. That's very true. And, um, you know, I think a lot of guys that do everything in their power to, you know, try to help that, like in the Marine Corps League that I belong to, you know, we're involved in trying to do, you know, doing stuff like that. And guys I know around the country are part of, you know, organizations to support the troops. And, and the Marine Corps League is not that old, is it? Well, it is. In Natick. In Natick. It's, it's 10 years. Right. 
but in 1937. That's were, when it started. Right. Okay. Um, do you feel in some way um, being in the military affected your later life? Sure. In what way? Uh, well, two ways, like what I just was talking about, you know, I think I do a lot in, you know, the Marine Corps League trying to, you know, support Marines coming home today. But, you know, a, a lot of, unfortunately, sadness too with friends that I knew that were such good friends that have, you know, since passed away. You know, that I don't have the pleasure of that company anymore that I miss. So having been in that service, you establish friendships that you probably hadn't anticipated when you first went in. Would that be true? Could you run by it one more time? That friends that you became such close friends with through the Marine Corps mm -hmm. and through your experiences that perhaps you wouldn't have oh, yeah. had that type of friendship, long-lasting friendship. Oh, without a doubt. There's guys that, you know, I, I grew up with, I've known since I've been five years old, you know, were together every day when we were kids, but these guys that I knew for a few months, they just, you feel like so much closer to them. It's a lifetime it's of a, friendship. It's a bond that you, you can't explain it, you know. Mm -hmm. Someone once said it's probably a cliche of, you know, if you know about it, I don't have to tell you, but if you have to tell you, <laughs> I have to explain it to you, you'll never understand. Have you ever opened up as much as you've had done with us today about this experience? I do because, you know, to me, everything I do related to Marine Corps League, what those Marines did for me in Vietnam when I got wounded, I, I do f to keep their memory alive. You know, I, <clears throat> I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for those guys. Is there anything else that you'd like to add, a closing comment after this remarkable interview that you'd like to leave us with today for not only family and friends, but others who will probably be watching this tape? Uh, just that, you know, I'm personally, you know, I'm, I'm so proud I can say that I serve my country. And you know that everyone respects everyone who whoever does. Well, James Hastings, we want to thank you. Thank you.